everybody, this is Gary Vaynerchuk and this is the Ask Gary V Show live in our London office at VaynerMedia. We have an audience in front of us. You guys can clap real quick. <laughs> and, and as you can tell, I have a very attractive, athletic looking man to the right of me, left for you, and so I'm gonna allow him to, you're welcome, I'm gonna allow him to, uh, I'm gonna try not to look at your pretty blue eyes too much. Uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the live audience and the audience watching at home, create a little context. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple of questions. We'll open it up to the audience and we'll do our thing. All right. So um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Danny Williams. I play for Huddersfield Town. Uh, it's in the Premier League and I used to play for Reading for four years. Um, before, <laughs> before I was in Reading, I used to play for, uh, in Germany for Hoffenheim and for Freiburg. And uh, my dad is American. My mom is German, but I was born and raised in, in Germany, as you can hear. Um, but I played for the US national team as well. Um, and that's all about it, really. So let's take it way back. Obviously, it's, this episode's a lot of fun for me for many, many different reasons. One, being in the UK office is a lot of fun. Two, I'm on this quest uh, to discover what is going to be my proper football team that I support. And we'll get, and we're gonna get, and the, the Spurs are, are in a very big lead. I'll give you uh, the details on that. Um, obviously, we're coming on the back of the World Cup. The US did not make it. Uh, I have a son that I'm excited to get into proper football, the culture of proper football. Esports is exploding. It takes me back to my thesis of why football is popping in America in comparison to all the other times because of a game called FIFA that came out for Sega Genesis in 94. There's a lot of places I wanna go with you from your perspective for my audience which is more marketing and business and things of that nature but before we get into all of that, how I'd like to set a little bit more context with you. How did your football career start? So you were born in Germany? I was born in Germany. And what, what happens? Like immediately you have a football in, by your foot because your dad liked it or how did it go down? No, not so much my dad because he's American. So your grandfather um, on your mom's side? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was, I think three years, my mom gave me like a football and uh, my dad, he was like, what are you doing? Like I wanted to play basketball or like American football or whatever. And um, yeah, I said to him, Did he not know he was in Germany? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't know. I think he still misses home, you know, but uh, he never went back because he's so scared to fly. Um, (laughs) No, seriously, he never went back. He never went back to the States. No, but I need this because this is going to clearly be the best part of this episode. One more time. (laughs) Where was your dad from in the US? He's from New York. Okay, so your dad, who's from New York, you're telling me that somehow he got to Germany, probably on a plane. Yes. Yeah. Um, but after a little while, he became so fearful of flying that he's never gone back because he's scared to fly? Yeah, well, so he was in the U.S. Army. Um, like it's getting better. Exactly. <laughs> like uh, all, all the Americans, no, all the mixed race kids from Germany. Yes. Um, like the, the woman, they like, they like the black guys there. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, uh, he came back. And um, yeah, so the minute he came back the second time, uh, my mom, he was, she was like, listen, you need to stay here. Like, I will not let you go again. And then basically it started. And ever since he stayed in Germany, he told me many times that he regrets it, that he stayed in Germany. <laughs> because his, um, his biggest dream was to live in California. But um, he met my mom and uh, they had me and then all of a sudden he stayed there. And that's the story. And he's still in Germany right now? He's still in Germany. And how old is your dad? He is born in 58, so he's... How old is he? 50, yeah. So 60? 60, yeah. yeah. So he's, that's right. <laughs> some play football, some do math. I mean, I know how it works. <laughs> so, so wait, so fine. So you get a ball at three, your mom puts it by your foot, and what, you gravitate towards it immediately? Yeah, I mean, like there's some, I mean, the, the local sport, the favorite sport, I think in Europe, is uh, football or soccer. Of course. You guys in the I, call it proper, I call it proper football. <laughs> And um, you have all the kids, they, they stay out late and play, play football and then you just grow with it, you know. And, then, uh, and were you good at it right away? Um, were you I always was, naturally good or did you have a spurt at some point? No, I was confident in kicking the ball but then I grew up with all the, like, with all the people next to me and then uh, over a sudden we played football and I was still better than them. And then they told me, Danny, listen, I think you should join a team, like a local team. My mom supported it and then um, 
I went there and then they told me, listen, Danny, you're a bit too fat. Like, you're chubby. I think you have to uh, eat less chocolate and, you know, like come off the Sprite and all the stuff and come back in a year. So I did that actually and then I came back within a year and, um, yeah, I think uh, I started my Can first we, how training old, session. How old were you then? I was maybe like five, I would say. Five, six is like young, young. You know? Clearly. <laughs> So uh, we started then, and uh, I was I was last. This is why Germany is good at proper football. <laughs> they uh, they tell five year olds to stop eating fucking yeah, chocolate. That, yeah, I know that's Germany like crazy. <laughs> um, and then I went back, and um, ever since I was lucky that the local team I was they had like like the first team was already in the Bundesliga, how they call it in yep. Germany, and um, so I grew up and grew and grew, and then. Obviously, I went under 10, under 11, and then when I was under 15, um, I got called up by the German national team. And uh, then it got quite serious because I knew, okay, you're selected for the best players in Germany. Before you got called up for that, Mm -hmm. did you have a sense that you could play at the highest levels? Or were you still young, insecure, trying to be humble? Like, before that, which it becomes so obvious, it's undeniable. Take me to the year before that. Did you have a sense or were you just aloof or were you focused on it? Like where was your mindset before that call up? No, before the call up I was quite confident because I clearly saw that it's easy for me to compete against one or two year older players, right? And that, were, that were good players. They were good players, but um, then when I made it to the German under 15s and I remember there was players like Thomas Müller and them, you know, so then I started to be like, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can make it, but uh, yep. you know, stay focused and whatever. And um, yeah, that helped me a lot because out of these insecurities, it taught me to train harder and go out a bit less. You know, yep. you start at uh, 16, 17, and yep. the girls get involved and all this stuff, as the guys know. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, then uh, when I was 15, I got um, this invitation from Freiburg, which is the best youth academy, I would yep. say, uh, in Germany. Yep. And um, my parents, they told me, Danny, I think you should take this opportunity because where I'm from, a lot of my friends back then, you know, they drifted apart and like, um, Sorry, I know, it was a po- yeah, it was a bit of a, of a, of a rough, you know, upbringing. Yep. So for my development as a football player, it was the best because I lived there, uh, they paid for my school, they paid for food, they paid for everything. And my parents didn't really have to worry about me anymore. And um, yeah, so I had this education from 15 to 19 and I learned a lot in them years. Before we get into questions and before I switch the topic to things around the sport and marketing and attention and other things that I like to talk about, when you think about your professional career, what are the one or two things that stand out the most? Definitely my first game, which was on TV because I could just see my parents in the crowd and they were crying and, and everything. So I was like, I better not fuck this up. <laughs> <laughs> but I was- Were you crazy nervous? I was so nervous. I, I didn't sleep the night before. Like I had to go to the toilet, like, I don't know, 20, 30 times yeah. in the day because- Your stomach was it, just My up. stomach was yeah. like, almost like now, but like, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I started to, to um, I don't know, try to focus again, but it was a big game because when I was playing for Freiburg, um, we played against Stuttgart and that's a big rivalry they have. And so right out the gate, your first match is like a, head, a big rivalry yes, match. Yes, it was a Friday night game as well. Um, and Stuttgart, they had players like Alexander Klepp, Semi Kedira, Paolo Pokretniak, you know, like the proper loaded players. That was like, I would say, um, I'm 29, that was almost like, yeah, almost 10 years ago. And, um, so I was so nervous. Well, at the first five, 10 minutes, I remember I left coming and I was just diving on the floor. <laughs> like, please don't pass me, but it was so good. And then after 10 minutes, I sat down and took a deep breath or whatever. And I just thought to myself, listen, enjoy it. Like you have like 25,000 people watching you, like all your friends that watch you on TV. And where I'm from, not a lot of people get the opportunity make to make it. So I thought, you know what, Danny, it's not that bad, even if you, make a few mistakes, it's your first game. I mean, come on, like, yeah. it's, it's, it's normal. And then, um, yeah, that was definitely one of the proudest moments. And um, I would say another proud moment was when um, we played against Brazil yes. uh, with the States. And yeah. I scored I scored a goal against Brazil, you know, like every kid dreams about like playing against uh, Brazil, Spain, like sure. England and all of that. So that was 
a proud, proud moment. And I remember I was playing against Neymar. And um, the funny story to it is that Firmino, I used to play with him in Hoffenheim. He just got called up to the Brazil national team. So, um, yeah, it was, it was quite intense, but I was very proud. Awesome. Talk to me about um, now you as a person in a category that I love a lot, which is social media. Where, you know, obviously I've, I've looked at your Instagram and things of that nature. Where do you today uh, sit with, with social media? What do you use? What do you like? How do you like it? Like, how do you think about it? How do you think about it as an athlete? How do you think about it as a guy? How do you think about it? Well, um, there's a lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages, of course, but... One what are the advantages? <laughs> advantages, the woman. No, no. <laughs> No, 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 just kidding. No, you're no, not sorry. kidding. You are definitely not kidding. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I promise everyone. No, I mean, you can, <laughs> you can, I mean, like, we are quite like, I'm a public person, right? Like, yes. people only know us from playing in the Premier League and yes. they see us on TV or whatever. And um, some people, they, they judge you by the way you look or sure. whatever. And, what I like about social media is that you can actually show yourself on a different side, other interests you have, maybe fashion or whatever, right? And uh, also you can still control what you want people to see um, because um, I would not necessarily put right. every meal with my, with my family or whatever in That's there right. because it's, at the end of the day it's social media. It's, you're in control, right? In control. You, you're in control about uh, you know, painting a more complete picture about yourself. You're in control that it's not somebody commentating on you and your play and your social life, it's you projecting it. Yeah. What, what platforms do you use? I use Instagram, um, I use Facebook, I use Twitter. And how do you use them differently? Well, so I have um, What do you use Facebook for? That, that's interesting to me. To be honest with you, Facebook, like I used to have a private account and yep. now I had like people running it for me. Yep, like, your fan page. Like a fan page. Yep. Um, but me, I just started to uh, get a bit more fun on Instagram because I think it's just newer and like it's more for the younger, yeah, and more for the uh, younger generation, yep. you know. So. Um, and what about Twitter? Twitter, like I have a team uh, who's running it for me too. Um, basically, what I put on my Instagram is similar to what I uh, put on my Twitter. Do you um, engage ever, or are you just consuming? I just like, consume. I yeah. would say, like because at the end of the day, um, what I don't like is when we lose. A game on a Saturday. People tell you you suck. And uh, people tell you that that's yeah. cool, like I'm quite immune to that. But like I feel if you lose and you post a picture two days after about you enjoying a know, meal. A meal or whatever. They're like, they why don't you fucking focus on the game? Why don't you fucking focus on the game? And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a human being, so uh -huh. I need to live as well. Uh-huh. Fair enough, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Talk to me about, just so it, because it's so current, obviously the US national team wasn't involved, but how, how did you process the World Cup? Did you, did you go? Who were you rooting for? How did you think about it? Obviously Germany underperformed. Uh, England performed extremely well. You know, you know. Um, <laughs> so how did, how did you, how did you, pro did you go? No, I didn't. Okay, know. did you want to go or you just couldn't go? No, no I didn't. You had no interest, fine. Because you were salty about not being in it, right? No, because I broke my ankle four, week, uh, four months ago and I was focusing on my real <laughs> Respect. Who did you think was going to win? For real. Um, Who did you think was going to win? If I had to place a bet, it would be Spain or Brazil. Right. And so how do you think it played out? What, what caught your attention? most about this year's tournament? I think the team which surprised me the most was definitely Croatia. Of course. Because they have amazing technical players, but when you see the size of the country. It's just over, it's yeah. Just exactly, so um, that they came that far, it's like a uh, big respect to them. Yep. So what about technology as a whole? And then I'm gonna open it up. So for the questions for everybody in the audience, like you wanna get very nerdy about Proper football, do your thing, enjoy it. If you wanna ask me a question about business stuff, fine. <laughs> Wherever you wanna go, I want, we're here for you. Um, before we open up to the questions, technology as a whole, having an Alexa at your home, like the way you watch TV, like how much TV do you watch? To be honest with you, I don't watch a lot of TV. So when you do watch TV, is it sports, is it movies, is it Netflix, is it, what, how, do you, how do you roll? Most of the time it's Netflix, yeah. And what are you watching? Um, I watch 13 Reasons Why yep. at the moment. Yep. Um, <laughs> you and a lot of other um, people. Yeah, and then uh, some people had me do uh, watching uh, Love Island. 
<laughs> Guilty pleasures always do well. What about gaming? Do you play mobile games? Do you play FIFA? Do you, do you play Fortnite? Are you doing anything in gaming? Uh, I used to play FIFA a lot and I used to play Pro Evolution Soccer. Yep. But I have to say um, that doesn't interest me no more. Yeah. Because, um, I don't know, us footballers, we have this like weird life, you know? We, we go to practice like every morning and uh, people think we don't do anything, but we actually do, it's quite <laughs> training. And then we come home and I don't have the, I don't have the, the, energy. the energy to, actually go and sit down and like game or whatever like I just like to chill like yeah. watch Netflix or like um, talk to friends or meet with friends and yep. actually connect Lit. with them instead of social Rude. media just yep. like you know whatsapp are you whatever I just yep. like to network with people like in real life uh, yep. I think that's uh, what we're supposed to do still as well so um, I like that. How do you actually, I apologize one more question before I open it up. How do you think about your post athletic career? Like what are your ambitions when you're done with playing? Well, um, I started to invest in some properties when I was coming here. So I own four properties now in London. And um, I was actually um, having a meeting with one of my um, people, like, you know, the companies who work for me. And we went through it and obviously like one of these um, questions was actually what you're going to do after football. And I think what I want to focus more on is like uh, rehab centers because I was quite unfortunate through my career with injuries and um, I think there's so much more uh, space and, and you know like development which we can do especially in the UK to um, improve rehabilitation so that's one where do you think about li- where do you think about living well you I, about that? I love Los Angeles like I really love it uh, I do like it a lot but like <laughs> <laughs> London Yep. Definitely, yep. because I used to live here for four years, yep. and it's close to home. Because uh, my parents obviously live in Germany, it's just yep. like one and a half hours flight. So um, you want to split? You're thinking about splitting your time there. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. Great. Who's got questions? I just wanted to ask when you went to from like the academy <coughs> into like the German national team, how did you find the cope when you were playing with a lot of better players and stuff? And did, you, did it ever affect your confidence? Yes. Did you like massively. Like it was quite intimidating because. You're in a club and they say to you that you're the biggest talent, right? So you think, okay, I'm going to go there and I'm going to rip it up. But then you actually play with some players from different counties, you know, different areas from the same country. And it's like, okay, you have actually players that are better than you. And then you start to realize, okay, maybe I'm not as good or whatever. So who was the first? Who was the first player you ever came across? Even if it was when you were five or when it was this big jump where you were like, holy shit. Like even if it's somebody famous or if it's some person that never made it, do you recall the first time you came across a player that you were just like, this is different? Two players that stood out, it was um, Tony <coughs> Cruz. I'm sorry? Tony Cruz, when I played against him in the youth, I was like, this kid is something else. And because of the speed? No, not because of the speed, because I, I think I'm quicker than him. <laughs> but, <laughs> And like just the way he moves the ball and like his first touch and everything is just crazy and the talent, the raw talent he has and also Mesut Özil. Um, some people probably don't like me to say that but he gets a lot of stick which I understand because of his body language and the way he carries himself. Um, you know, what stood page. out to you when you first crossed his path? With him it was just his calmness. Like I think I played against him and he was uh, probably 18, 18, 19 and I think he used to play for Werder Bremen at the time. And he was just like, how he moved the ball and everything, uh, he actually took the game in his hands already and he was 19 and everybody who ever played football, they know how tough it is to control the game, especially when you're a young player, because I mean, you have to have confidence that you have other people to believe in you to get you the ball and stuff and the way he created the chances. Um, and has, I think he's always two, three steps ahead of you. Like he knows the, the game's playing out up exactly. here. Exactly, and uh, that's like he really surprised me. Very cool. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, what was the key for you to overcome uh, people in your direct surroundings which are pessimistic about you know, what you were working on as a talent? The question is how were you able to overcome the inevitable pessimistic, you know, uh, cynicism, like when you, when, you know, at some point, whether you were eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you're saying, I'm gonna be a professional footballer. The odds of that are quite low. Mm-hmm. How were you able to not hear 
your friend or your uncle or a neighbor, I think for a lot of us, I think it maps to everything in life. Mm -hmm. How are you able to shut out the noise? What, What was it inside of you, parenting, results, somebody, why were you able to always, you know, because there's no way you end up to where you are without at every insecurity be able to say, no, I'm gonna get over this hump versus eh, I'm gonna go this way or I can't get over the hump or let me go backwards. And for me it was um, quite easy. I think whoever watched uh, Conor McGregor's documentary, you know, he always speaks about visualization. Yes. And I have to admit, the minute I was, I had the ball on my, on my, on my feet, I knew, I just visualized it in my head as like, I'm gonna be a professional, <laughs> professional um, football player. And it sounds weird, but I always had this belief and I saw myself kicking the ball in the stadium and it was crazy when I played my first game and uh, my parents, they stood there crying. I visualized that about like, I don't know, 17 years earlier, you know what I mean? Did your parents look the way you visualized them 17 years earlier? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> No, I actually, you know what's why I'm asking you that? I would argue I do a lot of similar things and they're just premonitions, it's not very clear but I always laugh that the people at the time look the way they look then and I always think it's funny because 20 years later they're much older and it looks different, <laughs> it, it looks different than it was in your mind. No, definitely. I get that. Um, and also, uh, like I just said, uh, when I grew up. Were your parents blindly on board? Was like, would your no, mom? No, 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 like I had a lot of trouble um, when I when I grew up, like my when I moved to this academy, my yes. mom, uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, cancer and uh, my dad had like alcoholic problems, and my brother he was in other trouble. So, like where I'm from is you know uh, not the easiest. But I always said to myself, I want to be the one who stands out from that family and want to make them proud, and I want to make myself proud because at the end of the day, I don't when, only have to prove that stuff to myself. When you're going through those kind of difficulties at such a young age, was the pitch, was the field a escape from all the definitely, shit? Definitely, like, I It always, was the medicine? Yeah, I always felt free when I was on the pitch. Like, because um, all the bullshit, what's going on, you know, yeah. like, the family, whatever, like, when I, the minute I step my foot on the pitch, it's gone. it's gone, I'm free. So, and then, it's funny because when I had more anger or when my parents, when they were fighting, you know, like two, three hours before, before a game, I would play better because I was so angry and I just let it all out on the pitch. I understand. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, as for fun, when you want to get closer and closer to the game, you want to get the change in room, you want to see what goes on 24-7 As players, how do you I'm gonna repeat that. It's a great question, thank you for that. The question is, as fans, we are now, especially in the new digital age, yearning for, aspiring, hoping that it could be a 24-7 thing in the locker room after the match. We wanna watch you eat dinner after the match and what you're talking about. We want that access. As a player, how do you feel about that? To be honest with you, I have not, nothing against it because I love going in the dressing room and uh, you know having banter with the boys, and it's just like so different from the outside world. Because even with some friends uh, I have, and they, have, they don't have to do anything with football, they're just so different. Like the, the I don't know the level of jokes and stuff. They laugh about different things that all footballers love. Of course, uh, and laugh so. It's so different and uh, I don't have nothing against it. I think I'll engage it. Let me ask you a question that I've always been interested in. Have there been, in the last three, four years as this world has exploded, this always on content world, have there been teams that you've been a part of that some of the players look down on the other players that are spending a lot of time trying to build their brand on Instagram, trying to sign entrepreneurship. Is there an animosity of like, this isn't the way we should be doing it. If you were this, like, is there, if they have a, you know, you talk about the fans saying, hey, why are you eating? Is there a, a level of tension in the locker rooms of, you know, some guys doing three public appearances and, and is that a keynote at a tech conference and isn't playing as well as the teammate thinks that he should, is there a little bit of that old school, new school tension in the locker room? Definitely, I mean you can definitely sense a difference when it comes to the the older generation, you know, the the players who who retire or about to retire, you know, the 35, 36 year old, then you have a player who's 18, 19 (laughs) and he just posts every day, he posts stuff what he's wearing, when he's in celebrities, when he's doing that, when he's (laughs) like crazy or what car he drives, whatever, you know. 
and then you can see the older guys that said, listen, focus on football, like, she just seriously, like, get a grip. But, um, that's just how it is, I think. Yeah. This, in this world we're living at the moment, like, it's a bit run by social media as well, and uh, if you use it the right way, you, you can actually capitalize on it as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, my question's for you, Gary. I was just sure. wondering um, whether you had any advice for smaller companies when working with big corporations and how to not be sort of taken advantage of yeah, I mean, the question, just to repeat it, is when you're a smaller company, how do you not get taken advantage of uh, by bigger companies? Uh, you know, Vayner was a very small company when I started it, and we worked with the biggest companies in the world right away with a little bit of my reputation. I have a very interesting answer to this. It's twofold. First of all, when you have your own company and you have clients, you're in control of whether you're being taken advantage of or not. If you're a client, provider, if you have clients, you're more than welcome to pick up the phone and say, I don't want to work with you anymore. And here's the money back or I don't want your money anymore. So first of all, every small business just needs to know that that's the great part of having a business. You're also in charge, right? Number two, I would argue for a lot of small businesses, the goal is to be taking advantage of. I think about the first three to four years of VaynerMedia, very similar to the way Muhammad Ali fought George Foreman in Zaire. I think I rope-a-doped the industry. I think the industry thought they were taking advantage of Vayner, and they were. We were doing so much more work for the money they were paying me versus the companies that were much bigger than us when we started. I also think that's why I let it happen because that was the value prop that we didn't have reputation. I was a wine shop owner now in, in you know, and social media was not what it is today when I started Vayner in 2009. Most of our clients thought that you know, it was a fad. So I think two things. One, you're in control, and two, it's actually probably the leverage you have, and I think too many small businesses go ideology on this. They become ideological about it, like, oh, I'm getting taken advantage of. You're a big boy, it's your bed, you can sleep in it. Like, I think you need to use it as an offense. I think it is the number one thing that a small, tiny business has over a big business that needs to make more profit, that needs to be you know, publicly traded and hit numbers. I think every small business should try to get taken advantage of. That's how they'll become a big business. Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, disregarding cash, if you had the chance to transfer to another Premier League club, who would it be and why? <laughs> yes, answer it, answer it. You put me on the spot. Then. Yes, this is the spot. Um, I. Growing up, I always supported um, Arsenal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry, I'm very proud. You're welcome. No, it's just because of the history the club has. You know, like uh, my generation, was, when I was young, um, I grew up watching Patrick Vieira and all of these players, the Invincibles, Thierry and they just create so much history that uh, I think if I was playing for that club, I'd try everything to bring that history back and also make the fans proud because I know you guys suffer at the moment with Arsenal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, in, it's an interesting topic. I, uh, I become so fascinated. So one of, my, one of the things in America that I'm spending a lot of time making jokes about on social media is if you live in New York City and you have a Steph Curry jersey on that I think you're a piece of shit, right? It's like, so, and, and to me, it's, I think you're a piece of shit, not because you're a bad person, but because I think, it's a, I think it's a very interesting psyche of when you pick a team, either based on the history or the current winning status, or when you pick an underdog. I find it, I'm interested, I don't understand why. Why do I hate Kobe Bryant until the last year of his career when he's a little more washed up, then I root for him. Why in every situation, if I turn on any match of any sort, something I don't even understand, if I randomly end up looking, uh, this actually happened. One day I'm clicking through, m- my son's getting into sports so I'm trying to get him into everything. I don't want to impose my, my opinions on him. I want him to taste things. And there's a cricket match. I can tell you one thing about Americans. You don't think they understand proper football? We really don't understand cricket, right? Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck? Anyway, like hitting it backward, I'm like, so anyway, it's on. I literally Google while the match is on, 
to figure out which team is the favorite and then I spend the next 10 minutes desperately rooting for the underdog. And I'm very interested in, when I started announcing when we opened this office that I wanted to pick a team, I'm fascinated that like 99% of people are fans of the same four to five teams, right? We all know who they are. In the same way in the US, whether it's the Lakers or, you know, or baseball, the Yankees, the psyche of people that wanna jump on bandwagons versus the psyche of the people that wanna pick something and pick an underdog. As a matter of fact, the biggest reason I'm not 100% locked into the Spurs is my only criteria for picking my team was that they couldn't have won the championship in the last 40 years. The problem with the Spurs is they haven't, but they're very fucking bougie, you know? And like, like, and I'm very confused by it. It doesn't map to my Jets and Knicks fandom as well as I'd like it to. So I'm still trying to figure my shit out, but, but, yeah, I just basically think that all of you that jump on good teams, when you live in a town that has a team, that you're actually a loser. <laughs> Questions? You should support yes. us. You should support us, actually. Yeah? yeah no was... championship in 40 years? No, no. All right, I'll start doing my homework. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tim. You've obviously been on a really interesting journey um, from when you grew up to where you are now. Was there a tipping point when you decided to take control of your life? Or is it something just, uh, just happened and Tim, before you finish, the question is, you've been on this interesting journey for a young man, 29 years old, was there a tipping point where you took control of your life? Based on the interview we've been doing, I'm curious, are you coming from the perspective of the adversity he faced when he was a youngster? Like, add a layer to that question, because I'm curious where you're going. He's, he's obviously very, you're very savvy about social media. Is there a point when you realize you need to do that, or is it something that's or maybe the investments, you know, not every young man is yeah, pouring I mean, his money into investment properties versus yeah, a Lamborghini. You've got to run your social media and mm-hmm. so you're obviously now taking control. So you may not call it leadership, but there's, you're, you're, you're leading your career and you're taking control. Well, the first time I started to realize that I have to do something with the money was... <laughs> was <laughs> when, um, <laughs> when I moved... When I moved to London when I uh, start to play for Reading, um, because you have to imagine, like I have my my friends and everybody in Germany, and then I'm in Vegas, right? <laughs> um, and my agent calls me and saying, like, Danny, I have an offer for you." And I was like, "Okay." And he goes, "Yeah, but it's not in Germany. It's like you have to leave your country and your parents and everyone." And um, I was like, "Cool, where is it?" And he goes, uh, "It's a club called Reading." And I was like. Where do I live? And he goes, yeah, you could live in London. I was okay. You know what? I'm quite a spontaneous person, and I think the people in Germany they're a bit uptight. So I think my <laughs> character, my character, and, and the way I, I carry myself, I think it fits more, anyways, to this city here. Um, so I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm I'm open to do that. And so I was in a hotel room uh, in in Reading, and I had nobody calling me. Like, there was obviously my mom, my dad, they, they messaged me or whatever, but I was just put on the spot, no car, no bank account set up yet, like nothing. And I was thinking like, where are all How old were you? I was 24. Okay. I was like, where are all the people? <laughs> 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 like, you know, they don't see me on TV anymore in Germany, so I'm not relevant no more. But still, like, I still have to live and I have to find like, I don't know, People who are like a social the, life, the social life, because that's the most important. I always say, if I'm not happy, I don't perform well. And um, so then moved to London, and I started to. Real quick, I apologize. Yeah. You say if I'm not happy, I don't perform well. I assume in the macro, because earlier in the micro, you said if my parents are fighting before the match, mm-hmm. I play better. Is that a macro micro thing, or was that an evolution when you were younger that worked for you? But over time, as you grew up, it changed. The thing is, like, obviously, the parents fight. The parents fighting is one thing, but yes. I was still happy about my social life. Like, okay, you know, I, got I, was, it. <laughs> I was happy. About so, if your social life is good, you play well. <laughs> you know, I, think so. I get I get it. it. I get it. Listen, if I'm I get happy it. From the yeah, inside, I got it. Then, obviously, I respect I can that. The shows on the pitch, but <laughs> when they fought, I can let the anger out as well. So I get I could it. Get that was the perfect of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your social life is killing it. Yeah. Your parents are fighting. <laughs> you fucking dominate. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Just want to make sure. Um, no, but then um, I started to um, hang out with people who would seem a bit more boring. Um, <laughs> who would seem a bit more boring to 
the f type of friends I used to have, yeah. but actually more interesting because he pulled me and said, like, Danny, listen, you signed a great contract with Reading, four years, that's actually big security, and you have to start to either buy something in London because the city is one of the leading cities in the, in the world, you know, it's the capital and whatever. So um, the property market, I think usually, like, nine times out of ten, the, the, the price will go up, and like, you know, you have to just generate another income of for when you when you're done with playing football and I said to him, Okay, never heard about that before because the friends I used to have they just didn't they didn't advise me on stuff like that. So um, I said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna rent a place in West London uh, and see, get to know the area and then after a year I will decide where I wanna invest. And I think that guy um, he helped me a lot and I will always be grateful for that because looking now I almost paid all of the, the flats off and um, I already generated income and the places are rented out, so I'm, I'm happy. That's a good place, I would say. <laughs> yes, in the back. I have a question for Gary. Okay, um, I'll get you next. The, is there going to be a, a flashback or a lashback in social media? So we're now seeing Facebook and Instagram. Yes. We now see how long you're spending on it. Yes. Are we moving into a clockwork orange? Yeah, I. Yeah, the question is, will there be a a, a pushback, a lash against social, uh, you know, time spent, the privacy issues? I think it's already happened, right? You already see companies coming out. You know, look look at Apple. Apple is a company that's not winning in social, right? There's apps on top of their app platform, but they're they're not in it. And so, if you're Apple, you're saying, ooh, if we build a default device on our phone that warns you of how much screen time, there might be a way for us to use that as a defensive play as an offense, right? Um, I think the privacy thing is a really interesting one, whether it's Brexit or Trump or many other things that are going on. I think we as human beings don't like to hold ourselves accountable. And so I do think there'll be a backlash against social, but I think it's gonna be more of us passing on responsibility of things that we don't want to see in ourselves. I think parents are very good at judging millennials without realizing they're the ones who raised them and created the entitlement. So I think the human condition speaks to, I believe the people that tend to win the most in life are the ones that are most willing to be accountable. And I believe that the masses do not want to be accountable. And I do believe that the mainstream media has a lot of financial reasons to downplay the digital world because it's taking their money and I think that all these dynamics are playing out. Um, so I think there'll be a backlash. Now, I think it'll be a blip on the screen. I think that we are going towards, I mean, I, when my friends are like, oh, I'm limiting my son's you know, screen time, I'm like, you do know what world your son will live in in 15 years, right? Just wanna make sure everybody knows we won't be going backwards. This wait, wait to voice is mature and you're talking to your Alexa like it's your friend. You know, wait to AR and VR and all these things continue. Like, the robots are gonna kill us in the end. You know, yeah. and so I don't, you know, to me, it'll be, a, it'll be a micro blip three years, six years, six months. But I think, you know, <laughs> when the whole Facebook Cambridge Analytica thing happened, people were posting protests of Facebook on Instagram. Like, it was just the most fun thing for me to watch. The human, like, fuck you Facebook on Instagram, which it owns. And so, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, I think we will, but I don't think it means anything in the inevitable macro of technology advancement. Technology always wins. Like, because we value convenience over everything. We are, we are animals that value time, subconsciously, and we will give up everything, including money. Uh, and that's what we spend our money on, by the way, if you play it out, so, yeah. Sir, behind, yeah. Yeah, so, Danny, you spent time with the German and U.S. national team. What do you think is the biggest difference? The question is just for everybody watching camera. Difference between the German and American national team and who do you want the next American coach to be of the American national team? I think the biggest difference between the German 
um, national team and the US national team. And how me, just for me, football. real quick. Yeah. How old were you when you were on the German team and how old were you on the, the American team? Um, I played Germany until I was 17, I'd say, 17, 18. Um, and then I started to play for the USA when I was 21. Okay, keep going. Yeah. So the biggest difference is definitely um, the education in like tactically, technically, because if I look at this, like US, US the, the country is so much bigger than, than Germany, right? And I think the US um, has amazing athletes, but they just don't know how to use you know, their speed, their power, their strength, because I would say we are better athletes than the Germans in general, just like um, you can see, you know, like um, sprinters and whatever, there's never a German guy winning. But um, they focus so much on um, technically and tactical work. Um, they actually invest a lot of money in research there as well because the, the youth coaches, they then fly to Barcelona, they go to Amsterdam where all the amazing academies are and they learn from them. Whereas in the States, I think because it's not the number one sport of the country, um, they're not really interested in, in that and they don't, yeah, they don't like to be bad in something which now, since we didn't make the World Cup, changed a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of more investment going on uh, for American soccer. And what about coach? Coach? Um, so, I think we have the interims coach at the moment, Dave Sarachan, and he's doing an amazing job, I have to say. I mean, we drew against France um, just a month before they won the World Cup, right? And um, he definitely changed um, the strategy of, of players' uh, scouting and recruitment. And he focuses a lot more on the younger players than in the past. You had a lot of politics going on um, for whatever reasons, which um, I got a bit slack off because I came out and said it. But um, yeah, there were players who already um, past, their prime. past their prime, like Germany now. You see it because they won the World Cup four years ago. Um, people thought that uh, some players, certain players still have to start every game and that was um, wrong and that happened with the States and it cost us the World Cup. So um, I just hope that the next manager will be someone who focuses a lot on the youth and um, makes decisions uh, football based and not political based. I think it's, you know, from somebody from a very outside point of view in the sport, um, but who watches culture very carefully. I think the most interesting thing about US football in the long term is two core things. One, it's the, just the popularity of the sport is real. Like, you, if you spend time in America, 15 years ago, I never saw a single kid in America wear a soccer jersey. It never happened. Now, you see as many kids you know, six to 12 wearing football jerseys as you do see them wear baseball or outside of ba basketball, football are still number one, but baseball and hockey and proper football are now hovering around the same popularity. Number two, the Latino population in the US is so extreme and exploding that I think the last names will look more like Brazil or Mexico or things of that nature in 16 or 20 years, but the resources are there. It's just, it's not religion. Like LeBron's playing basketball, not defense. You know, and then, so I think that uh, I think that's gonna be interesting to watch over the next mm -hmm. twenty years. All right, one more question. Hey, so I've known you over the last ten years, and you've been super. One of your cues for culture is hip hop. Yes. And from our first interview, you were always into the, the big artists, but yes. more recently you've featured Game and Nipsey and A Boogie. As you've got your nuances from culture when it comes to building a business in America and the UK, will you align yourself with? Uh, UK rappers as a source of learning the culture like Giggs and Skepta, Big Shaq, Jamie. And my question is, yes. what nuances will you be looking for when you talk to those artists to teach you things about things here in the UK? Yeah, so, well my dear friend here who's known me for a long time knows I've always really loved hip hop. As my Instagram over the last two years has exploded, uh, in parallel, Mike Boyd, who's always been close to me, had, was freed up to really do strategy for me and we took an approach about 18 months ago to get very serious about the emerging hip hop artists that we thought in a five to seven year window could become the Drakes or Lil Wayne's and what would that mean and get in the trenches of culture. The question is, 
am I thinking about that in a UK uh, lens as well? And it's kind of interesting because maybe you've noticed this and it's probably why, not probably, it's why we're sitting here right now. I've taken the approach in the UK and we're opening up Singapore in February. We're gonna open up Brazil, it looks like now in 2019 as well. It's interesting, my ambition to get deeper into proper football, having a, you know, a son and daughter that I want to like have a team and go through it, knowing that I'm gonna be here six or 10 times a year, um, and because I think authenticity matters, because I've historically not gravitated to the artists that you've just mentioned, I've actually taken the macro thesis of what emerging hip hop artists do for me in a pulse of culture in the US, I think the culture of Premier League and, and, and proper football culture in the UK and Europe as a whole is the way I'm thinking about that. I'm trying to spend time and listen and pay attention. I spend an enormous amount of time looking, in, in the US it may be world star as a Instagram account, but for the way I'm thinking about Europe and the UK in general, you know, it'll be 433 that I'll spend more time looking at. And so, interestingly, especially given that we're sitting here together, the approach is not going to be emerging hip hop artists in the UK unless, just like everything in my life, one artist catches my imagination at the right time. You know this, almost everything you love, food, sports, whatever it may be, it was one thing that then, that you fell in love with or were curious about that got you deep into the rabbit hole. So I wouldn't say never. I allow for a lot of serendipity but I also am thoughtful and have a lot of strategy. I think the culture of, of football here is what I'm spending a lot of time on, both selfishly because I want to suck myself into it because I want to get into it, uh, and because I think it is an incredible important currency of the culture. Mary, I, want, I saw you raise your hand so I want to oh, get your you. you're going to sneak it in. Yeah, Gary, um, so this is a question for you. How can brands drive true authenticity with the influencers while still retaining commerciality? So like, how do we make money through influencers uh, without putting our consumers off? Um, by giving the influencer 100% autonomy and eliminating our egos as brands and thinking that we know exactly what it stands for and what it means. I think the, what the biggest eye opener to me in corporate America and, and brand world is the level of ideology and audacity and ego. Like the thought that, like for all the normal people here, Coca-Cola and Heineken and Adidas think that the brand means the same thing to all of you. And that's just laughable. Everybody here when I say the word supreme or you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken or thinking different things, disgusting, awesome, rad, I don't know what that is. But, and so there's, a, there's an ideology that brand managers and CMOs in corporate America have about what their brand stands for. If you're gonna do influencer marketing, what you need to do is you need to buy sponsorship through influencers at a good deal. They know their audience. He, if he decided he wanted to do that, I, any of you, you know your audience. And so if your interpretation of this chocolate shake or sneaker or you know, blow dryer is it needs to be funny and snarky, that's exactly as a brand what you want. You're giving him, me, somebody else money so that you have something happen for your business. Stella wants business. The best thing for Stella to do is get out of the way They, much like the small business question, they're in charge of picking him. You picked the influencer. You've decided that influencer is somebody I want because she's so fucking awesome. I want to give her money so I sell shit. Why are you micromanaging her and telling her like, you better use the word great. I've never used the word, I've never done a sponsorship deal in my life and I have big audiences. There's a couple reasons. It's not how I think about my brand and it's not what I do. But even like case, like the case Swiss thing, that's a partnership, right? But when I signed my case Swiss deal, the most interesting part of the negotiation was the standard deal. Do you have a sneaker deal? Great. So the standard deal is like, motherfucker, you don't wear anything else. The I literally at the eleventh hour walked from the case Swiss deal because I wanted to wear whatever I wanted to wear. Like if I wanted to wear Air Force Ones, which I like to wear quite a bit, like I didn't want, I needed the authenticity of me, I didn't need the economics enough, and I think that's the best influencer, not the worst, you know, because we smell out bullshit. We're very, very good at it. Um, you know, you can trick us for a minute, you know, but not for an hour, and definitely not for a year. And so I think that, um, 
I think brand, brands need to check their egos and get out of the way. Much like I told that young man, you're in control. You can say no, I don't want to work with you anymore, right? Brands don't have to pick the influencer, but once they pick it, they need to get out of the way and let the influencer do their thing. That's the reason you pick them in the first place. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Let's clap it up for this wonderful thing. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them. Awesome, thank you guys.